welcome everybody to, to day three. Hey, Bill, how you doing? I'm doing great, JV. Great to be back with you. Good to, good to see you again. You know, I uh, b- before we get into this, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to sort of give everybody a little background. I mean, it's your career is fascinating in so many ways, um, but, you know, you have sort of seen it all. I mean, you grew up um, you know, I, I think you started at Xerox, right? And, and you know, but you've lived in the on-premise license and maintenance software world. You transitioned SAP uh, from that model to a cloud SaaS business, and now you're running a, a pure SaaS business at, at ServiceNow. So you've, you've sort of seen it all. Can, can you just give us a little bit of background? Absolutely. You know, one of the things I always humble myself with is how it all started for me. I traded in three part-time jobs as a teenage entrepreneur when I bought my first first company and I was uh, a teenager going to high school. And I I always ground myself in that because the little one has to do what the big one is either structurally unable to do or actually unwilling to do. And in that little delicatessen, I learned all I needed to learn about these big business problems because it was always about the customer. If they don't come back, you don't make payroll. Um, And what I learned is, you know, if the competition on either side of you doesn't deliver to the senior citizen complex, you should. If the big ones next to you don't give the blue collar workers like my dad credit, they should. And ultimately, I tried to get those high school kids to walk a block and a half past 7-Eleven in my store. And I really was fascinated why 40 of them would be waiting online when only four were in the store. And they told me, well, 7-Eleven thinks we're going to take things. I said, come on down to my store. And at that time, I, vi- I built a video game room, you know, with Asteroids and Pac-Man. Probably many of you viewers never even heard of it. <laughs> but it was the start of a game room sensation because everybody loved video games. And I let them in 40 at a time. And at the end of a long day, one of the young people said to me, Bill, we want to play video games, have good food and be treated with respect. We come to your store. And when we want to steal stuff, we go to 7-Eleven. <laughs> and that really stuck with me because, you know, everything in life is all about how you treat other people and the respect that you give other people. And we shouldn't overcomplicate things, whether the person is sweeping the floor when you go into the building or they're the CEO, they're a person. And if you can have empathy in your heart for other people, you can do a lot of great things with your life. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And you've carried that through. I mean, you, you, you sort of grew up on the sales side. Is that a true statement? Yeah, I started um, knocking on cold doors. You know, when I sold the delicatessen, I knocked on cold doors at 21 years old for Xerox in the skyscrapers of Manhattan. And uh, I love that job. I love every job I ever had. And, uh, you know, I just remember the attitude going into those buildings. I was going to cover every single door in every single building in my territory. And uh, when everyone else was going out to a liquid lunch or relieving the pressure by going clothes shopping or going home early because they could, no one was watching them. I was heading back into my next door or I was going back into the office to plan my next day. When did you join SAP? I joined SAP in 2002. Um, had an unbelievable run at uh, Xerox and Gartner Group and Siebel Systems and went to SAP in 2002. And at that time, they needed a turnaround story, uh, especially for the American uh, business, you know, the Americas. And, um, you know, we got very focused on the customer and where the customer wanted us to go. And we built everything from the customer in versus SAP out. And I think that's what you know, took a business that hadn't hit a number in uh, 20 something quarters to a a business that was growing at 50, 75, and sometimes even 100% year over year. And then you had this challenging job of of helping SAP transform to uh, a recurring revenue, you know, cloud business. Uh, That must have been quite a journey. Well, the main thing is, you know, we are now in the era of digital transformation. You know, we didn't call it that in uh, in the 2010 era when I became CEO of SAP, but it was digital transformation. Companies today do not have the time or the resources to create these clouds for themselves. They do not have the time and the resources to know what to buy, how to maintain it, how to upgrade it, and have all the skilled assets on premise to deal 
with the ever-changing landscape of information technology. So what happened was it was clear after the financial crisis of 2008 that the line of business executive, as well as the CIO and CTO, were going to align around, we got to rent this stuff. We got to get with the experts who do this better than anybody else and consume it as a service so we don't have to handle the maintenance and worrying about the upgrade and the innovation cycle. We're just going to buy a service. And that really has revolutionized the entire industry. And uh, I think it's driving cloud computing on a multi-cloud level. It's accelerating digital transformation. But the most important thing that it's enabling, if you play it right, is business model innovation. Because what got decision makers from there to here is not going to get them from here to there. So they have to really be thinking how digital and these platforms are going to be uh, key to competitively beating anything that comes in their space because their people aren't doing soul crushing work. They're actually focused on their customers delivering great products and great services and growing in geographies and industries and personas. They're thinking about a great future instead of maintaining the past. Yeah, that's that's a, a great sort of summary. And, and it's interesting, you know, when you think about the the business capabilities that are required of a business, a, a technology company in 2021 and, and beyond, um, how do you see those capabilities differently? You know, what, what's required today that really wasn't uh, a big critical success factor 10 or 15 years ago? Uh, I would put out empathy, first of all. You know, there were times where technology, if you had a decent product or a decent uh, service, would have been consumed even if you didn't deeply understand the customer. Today, you won't get away with that. You have to deeply understand the customer and their goals and start every conversation with what they're trying to do with their business. Really understand them. And I, I encourage people to prepare deeply um, before you enter into these conversations so you have a good guidepost on where you think they need to go. And then the meeting is more about confirming where they need to go. So empathy is going to be key. Um, the other thing that's really key is speed. You know, they don't have time. You know, so these long-standing multi-year projects, that's over. The multi-month projects are at risk. Um, it's more about weeks and days now. So everything is about rapid speed time to value, and how are you going to get the job done? And then I would also say in that regard, remember, you know, the customer is simply hiring your technology to do a job. You know, they're not like going on a rocket ship to Mars here. They're hiring the technology to do a job. The job they want done is they want some outcome associated with their employees getting a great experience or their customers getting a great experience and ultimately creating a loyalty effect where that technology or that service is doing something great for people. Because in the end, it's the people that really matter. And if you can deliver on those promises and innovate and take them someplace special, you do very good. Yeah, you know, it's, we talk a lot about what we call outcome-based uh, selling and outcome-based relationships. And, you know, the, 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 the old days of, <clears throat> let me show you my features and functions have really, you know, gone away, right? It, it is about, and, and I think you said a very interesting thing early early on, which is, you know, they they have their own vision of the business outcome, but, but ServiceNow, in this case, has done this with a lot of customers, right? And they're expected to bring a vision of the business outcomes that are possible to the table. And it's the merger of those two things, right? It's the merger of the customer's vision for where they want to go and the business outcomes that ServiceNow knows it can deliver. That's the magic. But it's not easy to get, you know, that sales team to really be adept at, at that, especially if they grew up feature function first. Absolutely. The, f the first and, uh, and, and most important thing I would recommend, you know, thinking about this strategically is understanding the dynamics of the boardroom and where the CEO is trying to take the company. And then there are always um, teams around the CEO that are aligning around common goals and shared values. If you don't understand that very clearly going into the conversation, you're not going anywhere. 
because there will be conversations where the CEO and the teams are actually just frustrated and stuck and they actually don't know where to go. So your innovation has to stimulate their ideation to take their business to a new, a new place. So I think the one tendency on value and this outcome based selling that I've seen, it's getting a little mechanical. And if you forget the innovation side of that conversation and you go right to what you think the value is, that's product selling. You're not really value selling. You have to first have the innovation at the edge of the cliff before you can take the value and then the post sale value realization conversation seriously. They want to go for a dream. If you can get the dream state really locked in, then you can control the whole conversation and take it all the way. Without the dream, don't even worry. It's not going to go anywhere. So operationalizing that, right? So, you know, and, and it's not just, as, as you well know, it's not just about selling the dream. It's about delivering the dream, right? Yes. Um, and and you, you brought up an interesting point, and, and I, we actually talked about this in our opening keynote, right? I mean, you know, a, as an industry, we – we got away with handing customers a lot of complexity. As a matter of fact, not only did we hand it to them, we monetized it, right? We had, you know, these big professional service businesses and maintenance businesses and, and all those things. And, you know, and, and we're, we're sort of, you know, calling an end to that, right? I mean, you know, we have, we have got to get this complexity out of the system. We've got to learn to master it. How are you thinking about that today? I mean, how do you tolerate complexity anymore? I don't. Yeah. I don't tolerate complexity. The ultimate form of sophistication is simplicity itself. The message has to be simple. The product has to be simple, consumer grade. The UX has to be gorgeous and pleasing for people to use. You have to really get into the details of how these products are performing. One or two clicks, it's got to be done. It's got to be as simple as ordering an Uber or getting DoorDash delivered to your house. These corporate enterprise systems have to behave beautifully. What's happened is, and I think COVID is going to really accelerate this. COVID will accelerate digital transformation. There'll be 7.8 trillion invested in digital transformation in the next three years. And people say to me all the time, my goodness, are we going to get any return on that? Because the 3 trillion that just got poured into digital transformation only delivers return on invested capital in one, one in four cases, 25% of the time. And then you say, well, why is that? It's integration. We have disparate people, systems, and silos in all of these companies. And the argumentation that I came to service now on was that workflow and the actual connecting of people, systems, silos and processes into a platform play across the enterprise where work could work better for people would be the ultimate breakthrough of the 21st century economy. And I still believe that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see that with things like COVID, you know, in a week we can we had to come out with emergency response applications and get businesses to handle the crisis. Then you had to return people to work safely as an option. Then you had to deal with vaccine management. How do you uh, how do you distribute it, administer it, monitor it? How do you get countries up on a platform to manage vaccines and turn them into the vaccinations? And we did that for hundreds and hundreds of millions of people around the global economy. It's because the platform does that. I call this the workflow revolution. We have to be able to take on the world's most difficult challenges because they're also the most big, great dynamite, audacious opportunities. So right now, you know, people should be thinking of, you know, what about the post COVID world? And, you know, linear people will think about, oh, it's cozy again. You know, things are opening up, I'm vaccinated. Let's go back to the way it used to be and start looking at Excel spreadsheets and 10% year over year revenue growth and have a party. But that's the wrong way to think. We have to now go into exponential thinking. We have to learn from what just happened. And we have to learn that a lot of what happened was actually very positive in terms of leveraging digitization and using new technologies to avoid soul crushing stupid work. And, and that also goes for how we used to impose that on customers. You know, 
I have customers every day on global uh, briefings like the one we're having today where I can move cycles through 10 times faster because we're just getting right at the point what needs to be done. Um, yet at the same time, people do need to go back in. Humans do need to interact with humans. So there's going to be this hybrid world that's great and we should leverage that and the whole future of work and making all the bad work go away so we can focus on the good work is such a breakthrough. And if you have a technology platform that can serve the greater good, you're going to be in a great position in the next five, 10 years. You know, one of the, the I, I would say one of the biggest challenges that CEOs deal with on a day in and day out basis is getting their organization ready to take advantage of the opportunity. I mean, what you just described, I don't think anybody you know, in this event right now would disagree that <clears throat> there's going to be just tremendous opportunity for those companies who are really able to, to operationalize the vision. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one, one of the classic areas that, you know, it, it, that everybody I think is wrestling with right now is, you know, there is this whole sort of go to market model, you know, transformation that, that everybody has to deal with. And, you know, you've we all grew up, you know, thinking that hiring more salespeople is the answer to, you know, to every problem that's out there. And, and now in this recurring revenue world, we have this emerging customer success function. And right. we're trying to think about digital customer experiences. Um, so when you think about, you know, the, the again, we, we, we know we need a really effective sales team, but we also know we need a, an effective customer success motion who can drive adoption and expansion and renewal. How do you right. think about the coexistence of those two organizations? Well, I've always believed in shared values, and common goals. One of the things we have to do is stop considering them two separate organizations because they're both in service to the customer. And if you can align their goal orientation, their value system, their compensation schemes, and really tie it more into the return that they're giving the customer and what the customer is getting out of the whole bargain, you'll start to motivate the right types of behaviors. Right now in most technology companies, the services side is a necessary thing, but it's not something that's the lead thing. I think we have to reinvent these businesses and create software businesses out of the services businesses themselves. I think the customer has to have a a la carte menu of the services that they wish to procure and it shouldn't be a segment of one thing. It should be something that's delivered on a continuous basis and they can switch from one to another at their leisure, but they subscribe to it no different than they would subscribe to a great software product. We're moving into a world where the consumption of value has to be thought of as the customer hiring us to do a specific job. It's our job to articulate with clarity what the job is that we're doing so the customer has has a clear understanding. Um, so we have to fuse these things together. We have to also be incredibly open to an ecosystem. Unfortunately, in tech, the ecosystems have developed on old rules. The vendor tells the um, partner, these are my goals. I need to achieve this. Build your services around it and we expand together. That's wrong. What we have to do is design things around the customer the specific industry or micro vertical that they're in, the players that they're competing against, what they need to do to win, and how that goal orientation of both the vendor who's got the technology and the um, partner who's probably got the services offering, how do they team up around that imperative? And what you'll find is birds of a feather flock together. So if you're dealing with a manufacturing company in Minnesota, there's going to be big similarities to one in South Korea. And this is how we build global businesses built on real, real value to real customers doing real things that matter. And that's really what makes great partnerships work, where you can move with great speed and agility to scale fast, get big fast. And that's not out of bounds with what the customer wants, because they want the implementation to happen yesterday. They want the value realization to happen yesterday. And actually, 
They have so much to do, they want to get on to the next project tomorrow. So speed and agility, the resilience of these partnerships have to be built on an unbreakable bond of trust and value creation for the customer. Yeah, you know, the, this issue of, the, you know, that, that everybody's got to transform, right? The, 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 the vendors have to transform, the partners have to transform, the customers have to transform. And, you know, and, and I, you know, we get asked all the, you know, all the time, right? What, what is, you know, I want more partners who have these capabilities. And, and quite frankly, there aren't enough of them, right? And many of the traditional partners are really struggling in this, in this transformation. So what do you have to say to them? We have a lot of, of them, you know, in the audience today. Um, how, do, how do you see their business model changing? How are they going to make money in five years? Well, I think the big, again, the big thing will always come down to the value creation for the customer. And I really do think that in the services business, there's great opportunities to have shared values with the customer on the outcome of the results that they generate. And even if that doesn't end up being pleasing to the customer, which it often hasn't been, because when you get to that level of the conversation, you're so confident in your ability to deliver and the customer can see it in your eyes. So right away, they, they'd rather get the traditional buy model. Um, I think it's going to be much more subscription based than it is today. For sure, that'll be the biggest change that you'll see. But there'll also be revenue and profit sharing much more between the services delivery model and the customer. And I think that's really a good thing because it just brings everybody closer and closer together. You know, I've always felt that leadership is all about inspiring followership. And you know, when a leader in services has a vision or a leader in a product business has a vision and they know what they're doing and they know what the value is that they can deliver, almost any business model can be pleasing to the customer because they're gonna ultimately get what they want, which is a great return on whatever they invest. And they're gonna have very happy employees or very happy customers and very happy shareholders. And that's kind of what it's all about. You know, um you know, this this whole conversation we had around complexity and, and the elimination of complexity and 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 tied to that, this notion of a digital customer experience. You know, th there are so many enterprise tech companies out there who are still of this mindset that, you know, that'll never be us, right? Our portfolio is too complex or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and we're saying, you know, quite frankly, that's BS. Right, you, you, you've you got to deal with that. And, and customers do want a digital customer experience. They don't want to have to go person to person throughout every single transaction in, in their entire solution life cycle. So, I mean, I, I get that there's a lot of complexity in these, these big legacy companies, but what do you have to say to them about that? The big problem that they all have is they don't know yet what they don't know. That's the big problem. And I'll give you an example. Yesterday, I was speaking with a very large, prestigious manufacturer. They cannot connect this supply and demand chain digitally. And you say, well, why can they not do that? Um, because they have so many departments. Um, they have so many legacy systems. They have so many different workarounds that they built with people doing dive and catches, solving problems. And they haven't truly rethought the value chain of a digital end-to-end -end supply meets demand process. Now that's the problem statement. Right away, what do they think they have to do? Oh, probably I have to upgrade my system of record to the latest release. And then maybe if I get it in the cloud, everything will go away. They're just making the ditch deeper because they haven't rethought the way the work is being done. I showed them on the now platform. And yeah, I am telling you ServiceNow does that. On the now platform, not only could we connect the supply and the demand chain, but I can call out a disruption on a fire in California and how that'll impact the demand chain. And, and then we push the workarounds through to the people on their mobile device on what they might wanna do to overcome that obstacle. And you give them machine learning, AI, and virtual agent options so they are well equipped to make a decision on the iPhone as they go about their daily business, as opposed to having 18 different meetings, nine conference calls, flying in from here and there, trying to figure out what the problem is. 
you got to remember one thing, JB, if I don't get anything across today, the world has moved from a system of record to a system of action. The world has moved from on premise to cloud. The world is going to be a multi cloud world. We are going to be responsible for business model innovation. The choices around digitization across the value chain have been made and there is no going back. And I think the big wake up call is don't keep pouring more and more cement on top of the system of yeah. record cement that's already been poured because you're not going to change the game like thinking in silos. You have to think in collaborative layers of work across people in different departments to get the job done. It's all about teams. I think everybody, you know, who's running a public company today, a, a large, you know, traditional public company um, has, you know, is going to agree 100 percent with your vision of, you know, your statement of of what they wish they could be. Then there's the the damn reality of of managing the stock through this transformation. Right. And I will never forget you are running SAP and you were out uh doing an analyst tour and you were talking about you know the growth in your cloud revenue and the i think it, you were on tv and and the, all they wanted to focus on was the decline in your license business yeah and you almost came across the table uh at the person who was interviewing you you know trying to say you're focused on the wrong thing right, right. It, you know right and and so this this thing of how to, even if you believe the vision how do I get my shareholders and my analysts and how do I manage my stock price through right. this transformation that you're talking about? Because all those things you said, right, rip and replace a new vision, you know, agility, recurring revenue, all that kind of stuff. It's great. But how do you get there? Yeah, well, you know, you, let's take the case studies and I'll give SAP as one case study. Uh, when we went on the cloud journey, the company was valued at 39 billion. When we finished it, the day I walked out the door was 170 billion. Um, take Adobe. Adobe, I don't recall their exact stock price, but it was probably similar to SAP's in that range. They were always pretty close. And now they're probably around 250 billion market cap. And they moved the business model totally to the cloud. And there are many other very good examples of that. It takes courage. And leadership without courage is not leadership. And at the end of the day, the capital markets are so smart. They understand the break even point between converting an on premise model to a cloud model takes some period of time. Could be a year and a half, could be two and a half years, depending on just how good your offering is and just how complex things are. A lot of companies make a mistake and the mistake that they make is they basically say, I'm going to take my traditional business, I'm going to rent it to you now, and I'm going to call that a SaaS business. That is not a SaaS business. And those are the ones that always flop because they're not really giving a true cloud product, digital transformation journey to the customer. They're simply changing their pricing model. That is not the conversion to the cloud. You have to go all the way. And then you have to explain to the shareholders the decline in the on-premise will be at such a rate. This is our, our prediction. And the cloud hockey stick will be at such a rate. And when they converge, which will take some period of time, say it's a year and a half, the only thing that the shareholder is giving up is in that one year and a half, there's going to be a margin compression on the operating results. But on the other side of that hockey stick, they're going to have a great corporation with super happy customers and unbelievable revenue growth, margin and free cash flow expansion. So where do you want to be? And the leaders have to really get courage and the boards have to tell the leaders, look, we need a leader who's in it to win it. And if you're just harvesting the next two years until you retire, it's probably not going to work out. Yeah, I couldn't say it any any better. I, and, you know, those companies that get stuck in the middle, right? They're they're afraid to be courageous. They're afraid to be bold. They're afraid to take the story to the street. You know, it might not be a year and a half or two and a half. It may be five or six or seven because they get stuck in the middle of the transition, right? Yeah. So, um, but, so hey, Bill, you know, yeah. That's big, that, you're on a big point. You know, most people are afraid of that success. They're afraid of taking that chance. And if they weren't, 
the ones that aren't afraid wouldn't stand out so beautifully. So all I can say is it's always fascinated me that people are afraid of taking the shot. But that's what makes, you know, the few that aren't afraid to take the shot stand on top of mountains with flags in the ground. Yep, that's right. You know, you've always been a, a, a sort of a, a visionary leader, and I know you inspire a lot of people. So w- when you're thinking to yourself about what's possible, right, w- what what could um, a technology company be able to do five years from now that will really revolutionize their value proposition to customers? I mean, how will we look different? How will the winning company operate and think differently five years from now? Well, one thing I think a winning company should do is literally make a checklist of every single department eliminating the top 10 soul-crushing, mind-bogglingly stupid things that they do and literally make a list of them. You know, when I think as an example about call centers fielding 250 billion calls a year, and most call centers have 30 to 35% turnover rate of the people that work in them, and they have 100% of the people that work in them that maybe hate their job. You have to say that that would be one mind bogglingly stupid thing to do. So why don't we just change that right now? And when you think about the application of machine learning and AI and virtual agents and the power of workflow automation using you, human capacity, right person, right skill set, right empowerment level, ready to help the customer at sub-second speeds, but don't have to field the whole call, and then using technology to source the information, retrieve the information on what the cure plan is for the particular issue the customer is having. Just do like a list of those 10, and that's my top one because I can't believe how people are still suffering out there. Um, That will change a lot, a lot of things. And um, I also believe that we have to start looking at how we make work work better for people. I think technology is just too hard. It's just too hard for people, and it doesn't make their life better. And if we can't start thinking about every use case tying into the human experience and making people's lives better, we're just wasting a lot of time. And, you know, even if you had a billion bucks in your pocket this morning, you can't buy one minute worth of time with it. So we have to make every minute count. So anything that's about human experience, helping people live to their fullest potential, moving the customer relationship forward with such ease and grace and digitization that they walk away saying, wow, what a company that is. And when the people had to get involved, they knew exactly what was going on, got me through my subscription process, signed me up. I feel fantastic. I think I'll go play golf now or maybe have a martini. I mean, literally make them feel fantastic. That's great. Well, listen, Bill, we are out of time. It was, uh, once again, just super enjoyable to spend time with you. Um, I think everybody in the audience got a, a, a lot of great wisdom and, and joy out of the conversation. You continue to be uh, an inspiration, and, and everybody really appreciates your focus on people. It really is yeah. in- inspiring. Um, and as you said, if you if you take care of customers, a lot of good shit happens, right? So, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Look, JB, as you know, you can get anything in this world you want if you help enough other people get what they want. Focus on that. You can't miss. Amen, brother. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Take care, Maria. Bye-bye. Thank you, Joe.